Welcome everybody. It's uh, great to be here in Tasmania uh, to announce a very important policy in the coming election for Tasmania, which, which we think is long overdue. I've got a strong background with Tasmania. My, my uncle left Tasmania in the Second World, the First World War in the 40th Battalion, never to return. My father stayed at radio station 7UV in Olveston, Tasmania. My mother was born in Penguin, and uh, I've got a strong commitment to Tasmania and all its people and all that it can stand for. So it's very disappointing to see that the economic performance of the state hasn't been what it could be. There's widespread unemployment, and in some cases there's third generational um, people relying on Commonwealth benefits. So we think, the United Australia Party, that we have to draw a line in the sand and do something positive for the state to encourage people to bring in a prize here and so that Tasmanians can be all that they could be. And what I'm announcing this morning is a, a special economic zone for Tasmania that the federal government can implement and that can provide a much better life for the people that live here. Firstly, that involves a benefit of Tasmanians and, and uh, corporations that are based in Tasmania paying less, 20% less tax yearly, and that will act as a great incentive to bring industry here. We want jobs and we want industrialisation. While agriculture is a very important part of the Tasmanian economy, we need to diversify to offer, offer jobs for people and address many of the critical uh, issues that are facing young and the unemployed. There needs to be a higher level of skilling and training, and the Commonwealth Government should play a key role in doing that. It's no good, really, just circulating the same old ideas. You know, insanity, the definition of insanity is uh, doing the same thing over and over again for no result. And Australians have been doing the same thing over and over again for no result since the end of the Second World War, voting over and over again for the Labor Party or the Liberal Party, and they've been totally uh, unresponsive to the needs of the Australian people, especially the needs of people in Tasmania. If we have a look at what's been happening in Europe and other parts of the world, we can see that these sort of enterprise zones and incentives have paid a tremendous part in alleviating poverty and encouraging enterprise, and that's what should happen here in Tasmania. Ireland has become an exceptional example in Europe, where Google, Yahoo and other corporations had the incentive to locate in, in uh, Ireland uh, rather than in mainland Europe. Um, so we think that will be something that will be very important in the future. You know, 55, 85% of Australia's wealth is created outside mainland capital cities. And that gives you an indication of the type of wealth that can be created here in, in Tasmania. And then when Robin Gray was Premier of Tasmania, there was a balanced uh, surplus in Tasmania. So the question is, it can be done, provided we have the incentive. And the biggest incentive for everyone, I think, is to have a job, so that at least they have self-respect and they can know what they can do. This is especially so with women. Women need more opportunities to have better jobs, to be higher paid. It's not just a question of equal pay, it's a question of opportunity. It's an opportunity for all our citizens, not just uh, one section of society. So we hope this sort of an economic zone will extend across to people uh, of all nationalities, all races, <laughs> living in Tasmania and all genders, so that they can each lift themselves up to a better future. Um, Tasmania plays a crucial role in Australia. It's one of the foundation states of the Commonwealth. It needs to be regarded as such. It needs to have the priority. Unfortunately, over the years, we've seen more and more um, focus on Sydney and Melbourne and large population centres. One of the benefits of the Commonwealth of Australia is it a Commonwealth. It's a Commonwealth of all states working together. And that's why we look at our party, the United Australia Party, as being something that should unite all Australians, regardless of their political views, on a common agenda. A common agenda to make this country greater than it is at the moment. But first of all, the overriding priority is to put Australians first. So for every possible issue we need to think about, our government should be putting the people of this country before any other consideration. And that just hasn't happened in Parliament. You see that the current lot of politicians we've got um, are spending every day making fun of each other, arguing with each other, and they just don't care about you. They don't care about our country. So that's why we've established and re-established the United Australia Party, so that we can be united as a nation and focus on the people that live here. I hope all Tasmanians, all Australians, will vote for us at the coming election. And the support we've been receiving across the country is unprecedented. 
There are people and there are candidates in every part of Australia, 151 in the House of Representatives and Senate teams in each state that are standing at this election. The normal Australians that have done so because they want to serve this country, they want to serve the country they love and want to make it a better, a better future. We don't want to think of people as either being left or right or being Liberals or Labor, because that automatically divides us as Australians. It limits our potential of what we might become. The Anzacs didn't go to the First World War as Liberals or Labor, they went as Australians. And we want to take away division, diversity, and, and, and also focusing on individuals and focus on policy and performance and what we can each do for each other. And that's what the United Australia Party is all about. Can I answer any questions you might have? How much will this policy cost and how will you pay for that? Well, if you have a look at our total uh, uh, package of policies, one of our critical policies is um, moving the date for the payment of provisional tax. At the moment, you know, people pay their tax and companies pay their tax in advance before they've earned, earned the money. By moving that date to the end of the year, when people have earned the money from before, when they haven't earned the money, we can do a couple of things. First of all, we limit the amount of insolvencies in Australia. A lot of companies go to the wall because they can't afford to pay provisional tax when they haven't earned the money. But most importantly, we inject into the economy another $70 billion, because that's the amount of provisional tax equivalents that are paid each year in the Commonwealth. Now that $70 billion will turn over at least five times before it's due to be paid at the end of the year and attract a 10% GST. So we'll generate another $35 billion worth of revenue for the Commonwealth Government. And, and that will assist us in, in counterbalancing various incentives that we're offering people. The other important, important tax issue is of course we want to make ta um, home loan interest tax deductible. You know, Australia used to have a 95% home ownership rate and it created great stability for our society. We now find our home ownership has moved down to about 70%. Everyone has a strong interest in ensuring that people have a home and stabilities and good family life. So that, that goes with that. And I guess those two things together, as well as our pension concessions, take care of the funding of those operations. 20% can I ask? Sorry? 20% is obviously a significant number that we're talking about here. I'm just wondering, how did you arrive at that 20% figure on the tax break to business here? Mm. And um, what are the economics behind that? Well, we, we arrived at it because some, we thought something significant had to be done for this state. While you might say it's a big number, the state's amount of revenue for the Commonwealth is very small. At the moment, the Commonwealth pays $1.76 for every dollar that they raise in Tasmania, right? So that's an intolerable situation, not just for the government subsidising Tasmania, but also for the people living here. But more than modelling, I guess, is what I'm wondering. Where, yeah. What modelling have you done behind this? Well, you have to look at the overall economics. Australia is the third lowest debt country in the OECD. It's one of 13 countries in the world that have a AAA credit rating. Politics should be about seeing the priori priorities for your people. The question is to look at not just modelling but your financial capacity. Australia has a great financial capacity and it's much better to provide some incentives now to get the economy moving in Tasmania so you eliminate long term having to pay $1.76 a year. We think, if you look at what's happened in Ireland, that you'll have a lot further in investment here in the first three to four years and, and Tasmania will become self-sufficient. So the proposition really is that we're saying you should invest in your own people. If you have a look at superannuation today in Australia, nearly 60% of it is invested in North America and Europe, yet Australians are not getting the benefit of that. One of the other initiatives we'll be doing is requiring at least half of all superannuation to be invested in Australia so we create jobs here and wealth for, wealth for our own country. Mr Palmeris, is this policy um, possibly unconstitutional? If, if we look at the constitution, mm. it says that you can't discriminate against states based uh, using taxation. Mm. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Yeah. Um, isn't this exactly what this does? No, how it actually works is that you're assessed your normal rate of tax and you're given a 20% rebate, right? So, so it's paid back? It's paid back. It's a, it's a credit, if you like, right? So the amount due is 80% after you receive the rebate. So the legislation would give it a rebate. That makes it constitutionally acceptable. So how and actually, rebate paid? Sorry, where does that come well, from? Well, it's credited to the amount of tax that you would have owned. You receive a credit. Um, that's actually happening now. The zonal taxation in the current structure uh, at the moment is just it's only a couple of hundred dollars, right? And it works on a rebate system, um, much as the Medibank levy works separately as a tax, right? Have you done any, um, any calculations to figure out how much this would cost the, the federal budget? Because you must 
uh, I guess, understand if you're talking about offsets, how much this policy costs? Yeah, well, we, we have done modelling on it and we found it was insignificant considering the population currently in Tasmania. Um, you see, at the moment, there's a lot of industries that are not here, that are not producing revenue, and if they, they relocate here, they'll be providing jobs for people, and there'll be a counterbalancing for people coming off uh, benefits. Tasmania has a large population which are on Social Security and which become a cost and a burden. So we think people would rather have a job and certainly be employed, earning their pay, than, than uh, being a burden on the rest of Australia. So there's a great credit for that. So the modelling that we did show was that after year five, there was a crossover. That, in other words, the money you were saving from Social Security benefits by having people employed was a, was a negative, was a sort of a, a balancing act. And of course, a lot of politicians won't do things until they're 100% sure, that's why they do nothing. But my experience in life has been that you have to look, look and make a judgment. And that's what we're not doing in Australia at the moment. That's why most of the politicians you talk to are pretty boring. They won't do anything. And we need to do something for Tasmania. It's gone on for too long and too many people's lives have been stagnated and too many families have been broken up where people leave this island and go to Melbourne or Sydney. Um, families break up for financial problems and there's many people in Tasmania that it can't even afford heating. The level of poverty on Tasmania has got to an unsustainable level as far as, you know, as far as the rest of Australia goes. So something has to be done to change the inequity. Do you give people more subsidies or do you provide them with incentive to lift themselves up? That's the question. Just talking about Tasmanian, uh, just talking about Tasmanian um, candidate here, um, I'm just wondering... Um, Which one? <laughs> um, Mr Starkey. Mm -hmm. um, why are candidates claiming to be descendants of Prime Ministers when the late politician's family are disputing it at the moment? Well, if you, if you, if, if, firstly, I know we get involved in family disputes, since you can probably understand that, right? But if you, it's if on you, your website. Well, if, but if you go back and have a look and do a Google search, you'll see there's a lot of information about Mr. Starkey and his involvement with his family and what there was, and about the various disputes that the people are criticising him have. And this is going back well before this. We've satisfied ourselves that um, he is who he says he is. Um, and of course, there's a, there's a whole lot of inheritance issues, there's other legal matters that have happened over the years. So we don't want to get involved in that, but we're confident he is who he says he is. What is the descendants that we spoke to today just sort of described it as nonsense, rubbish, um, garbage, and well, um, they're sending through the family tree and, and it is on your website. So I guess we're just wondering, yeah. Well, I, well, that's one section of the family. That's all, there's two parts of the family. And um, that's one section of it, that's what they say. What about your candidate, uh, Darren Winter, uh, the, mm. the post that emerge of him talking about slapping teenagers? Are you concerned about that? Well, I think we have to look at things in context. You know? um, the posts, that, you know, what's more important about our candidates is what they can do for you, not what they can do for them. And this is a post that goes back about 10 years. As it says in the Bible, he among us without sin can cast the first stone. I think all of us have done things in our lives that we sometimes regret. If that's the worst thing that Darren's done, it's not something we should judge him on, really. We don't want people in there that have never experienced life or never been like us. We want people who are one of us, who may not be perfect at every single centre in their life, but are prepared to serve the community. You but know, public is service... Is experiencing life... Um, Sorry? Is experiencing life suggesting that teenage girls deserve a slap in the face if they Well, uh, what, what's the date of that statement? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, so it's, it's a long time ago, it's nine years ago, and it's a statement made to a member of his family. It's not actually, you know, it's not a public statement on behalf of our party. But I mean, as I said, that to me is a minor issue compared to some of the issues we've got to deal, deal with in politics. Do you, do you, do you think that um, it's uh, misleading the public in order to get elected? No, I don't. I think, I think we're happy with, with, uh, with him as a candidate and, and we think his claims are correct. Are you confident in your vetting process? Absolutely, yeah. On the economic, um, back on the economic side. Okay, we're jumping about. Um, sorry, the, um, so in five years it'll become cost neutral. In yeah, well, we project it as cost neutral, right? Um, and and like any modelling, that's, 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 that, that's, that's made of, ma, ma, uh, that's, I haven't got with me those costs, so I can get them to you, but that's made up on a number of assumptions, right? Um, I expect those assumptions to be correct, but uh, what we've got at the moment is a, a, a very, um, distressful situation with a lot of people in Tasmania and something needs to be done to assist them. And that's the reality of it. So you can sit by and do nothing or you can try to provide real positive insistence and incentives and we've decided that's what we should do. Do you still believe that giving um, 
WA 100% of the GST that's generated in WA mm. uh, back to that state? Yeah, so I think what you want for all Australian states is that they're, that they're, um, they're um, self-sustainable, right? And that's what we should be looking at. So with Western Australians, we want them to be self-sustainable and have the benefits of their toil. And we also want people in Tasmania to be self-sustainable. So rather than give handouts to people in Tasmania forever, we want to bring people in Tasmania up to a standard of living where they can have respect in their own performance. And, and this, this island's given a lot to Australia in years gone by. It can do it. So we'd rather give them the incentive for people on, the, on other parts of Australia to invest here because it's a great place to be. Look at the view we've got out here. Look at the resources that are available here. The trouble with this island is that the Greens, uh, they, 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 they cut half of it up. They stopped and said, you can't go, you can't develop that. And, and we don't care if the people starve. We don't care what happens to people. We're more concerned with what ha happens to animals or other things or, or just imaginary things. Right? Um, and that's the trouble with Tasmania. And we've got to unwind that and say that the people of Tasmania matter, that they've got children, they've got feelings, they've got futures, and they matter. And, you know, the Greens have destroyed this place, and they've destroyed it from a number of bases. They've destroyed it because overseas countries won't invest here, a lot of large corporations. I'm the wealthiest person in Queensland. I've got a net assets of $4,000 million, so I wouldn't invest in Tasmania until there's a proper structure here. And, and you need to go do that. Do you want to ask a question? This is why we don't even hope out as slow bar. Slow bar, that's right. How do we get around the Greens? Though? Like, right, right. Well, we vote them out. And you, you, put it, you throw them out. I mean, you take the Greens and they're based with GetUp. Bill Shorten established GetUp. He was one of the founding members. They're funded by offshore interests. They don't care about Australia. The industry, industry up the West Coast. Mm. The minerals up there. We could be as rich as WA. Of course you could. And, and not have to worry about yeah. having all their money saved. So the proposition is... Do we have to rely on WA being successful or can we be successful ourselves, right? I'm saying we can be successful ourselves and that's what our focus should be. Not getting more handouts but getting more incentives so that we can become a very prosperous society. Do you reckon there's no GST revenue, is that right? Sorry? That Tasmania's... Um, Look, GST revenue was set up to support the states. The basis of GST revenue was that you have GST, you eliminate land tax, payroll tax, and other things to create an incentive. That hasn't happened in Australia. It's been shuffled around by the Commonwealth Government. It wasn't what it was designed to do. We all know that whether it's GST or whether it's uh, federal revenue or it's the budget, the same amount of money will come to Tasmania. It's just ir irrelevant to meet those needs that have to be met while we make a transition. But, you know, we have other means of dealing with, with deficits in Tasmania in the short term. But the point is, at some stage, you've got to say, we want to stop having deficits here, we want to have our people to have an opportunity, and we've got to believe that we can do it and believe that Tasmanians could do it. Now, if you have a look at Japan, for example, it's become the world's third largest economy on the back of Australian resources and Australian energy. You know? Yet, we export all of that. Don't we think that we can do it ourselves? Why haven't we got confidence in ourselves? Why are we always saying that we can't do things? I think Tasmania can. It's a wonderful place. But if you've got 50% of it locked up for no development, you're starting with one hand behind your back. That's what Bob Brown... You know, Bob Brown was up in Queensland, where I come from, with a convoy of people coming from... of greenies coming from Victoria, telling the people they've got to shut down their coal mines. Yet Bob Brown was here on the Franklin River in the mid-1980s saying we need coal-fired power stations in Tasmania to save the Franklin. I mean, where's the consistency? It's not about what they really think. They're just naysayers. You can't do anything, no matter what you want to do. We're saying, yes, we can. We can do things, and we should try to do them. And this policy is designed to give Tasmania the incentive to do it. It's to send a message to other corporations in other parts of Australia, other parts of the world, that Tasmania is open for business, that you can come here, you can invest, and you can prosper. And, of course, you've got to provide that sort of an incentive. And if you've got people unemployed today, right, um, that now will be employed and coming off welfare, that's a great positive benefit, not just financial benefit. Did you have a question there? Yeah. We're, we're trying to get a cable car here yeah. to go to the mountain. Mm. The Greens are holding that along with a few other ideas. You know, well, imagine the tourism that we create here. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm just saying that we can't tolerate this sort of rubbish any longer. Um, and that's what we're saying, is that we want to introduce this policy to say that what comes first 
is Tasmanian people, this economy and supporting those people. And this should be a special, a special enterprise zone, that there's more incentive for more in enterprise to do more things. And the Greens would say, this should be an area we lock up and do nothing forever and people come here to die. I don't want to die. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Why, why is he running for, to represent Tasmania in the Senate? Because he'll be living, he's moving down to Tasmania next year at his job, right? Yeah. And he's somebody that's been in our party for a long time. And he's got particular skills which will be helpful to Tasmania. We need to spread our vision a bit broader than just the talent that's available in Tasmania. He's, he's coming down here to live anyway. He's our number three candidate, of course. Our other two candidates are certainly long-term Tas Tasmanian residents. For Tasmanian um, voters, mm. how can you guarantee that if they vote for you, uh, they'll still get a, a, a party member? How will you solve um, things like the, Jackie Lambie's um, defection? Well, I, I don't think I think that was a positive for our party, really. To be honest with you, um, it's was not it about. A state, though? Sorry. Was it a positive for the state, though? No, it wasn't. But um, that's a matter for her. I wouldn't be voting for her at the next election. She's preference last on our card. But we've got some really outstanding candidates at this election, there's no doubt about that. And they're sticking by the party? I think that, yeah, they are. I mean, the press knows that. <laughs> They've been ringing them up for various things and they found a very positive um, yeah, team of people across Australia. And, of course, you've got to remember that when we set the Palmer United Party up in 2013, it was six weeks before the federal election and we gained the balance of power and I got the largest swing in Australia's history at 50.3% in the seat of Fairfax to the elected the House of Representatives. So it was done very quickly. This time um, we've been taken a lot longer to do that, to get our candidates together, and we've spent a lot more money. We've spent something like $50 million so far across the oh, not quite 50, but 50 meaning when we get to the election. And uh, that's because we wanted to ensure that there was proper choices for Australians, you know, that the Liberal and Labor Party have for years spent between 50 and $60 million on their federal elections. And, of course, if people can't afford to do that, they can't put those choices up. And if you look at our advertising, we've put out our policies so people know what we stand for. And whether we get elected or not, it's public service. And public service has no reward. History is your only reward, really. But Australians should have a choice. And all I'm saying is from the Second World War, we've just had Liberal or Labor, and that's what we've got. And look what Tasmania's got since the Second World War. If I was living here as a Tasmania, I'd say it's unacceptable. We've got to do better. We've got to do more. If you go up to central parts of Tasmania where I've been, there's a lot of people living below the poverty line, a lot of people that can't afford to put on their heaters. And this is supposed to be a first world country. They're living like it's a third world country. Mr, Mr. Palmer, if, as you've predicted, the United Australia Party wins the majority of seats in the lower house, mm. who's going to be the Prime Minister? Well, who's the Prime Minister is not important, but it, I could be the Prime Minister or someone else could be. Um, the reality of it is, is what's important is what policies and what benefits we can deliver to the, to the Australian really people. Important, Sorry? Well, it's, it's important, but really the focus has been on individuals, not on policy, right? Is ScoMo good? Is Shorten good? Well, I want to thank Bill Shorten for giving us his number two preference in Franklin and Clark. Bill Shorten said he didn't like us, but he gave us the, his, his second preference here. And that just proves he is a liar. Yeah. And on that, can you tell me or tell us what, what deals, if any, you've made with the Tasmanian Liberals because they've preferenced you highly in every seat in Tasmania? Well, we had an announcement last week publicly, you may not have seen it, where we've explained that we've um, been in negotiations with the Labor Party and the Liberal Party for about six, six weeks and we had to make a decision. Um, the, the Labor Party, in essence, we could have been behind the Greens. Now, would you want to stand behind Richard Neatali and all that lot? And we, when we judge the um, Labor Party, we know it's fused at the hip with the Greens. We know the Greens want to bring in a 40% death duty tax so that if you die, you can't leave your property to your children or to your spouse. And we think that's wrong. We know that Bill Shorten talks about negative gearing. He wants to bring in a situation where Australians can no longer claim as a tax deduction the interest on property loans. But at the same time, foreign corporations can. And, and that's how he's hoodwinked the Australian people. He only cares about the big end of town. If, if Bill Short was, uh, was serious about negative gearing, he would stop companies from doing it as well as individuals. He's not doing that. He's just saying Australians can't do it, foreign corporations can. So if you're competing in the real estate market, straight away a foreign company has an advantage. 
I think Tasmanians and Australians should have that advantage, not foreign companies. So how could you ever, ever think of preferencing the Labor Party? That's, that's what was my point, point of view. Right? And we decided nationally to preference the Liberal Party because we had to make a decision. You have to number every square. Normally, it's not a big thing who you preference, really. All political parties decide how they're going to number every square. All political parties want to be voted for number one. Why this was a big controversy in Australia? Because it went to the integrity and the honesty of a person that was offering themselves up to be Prime Minister of our country. And it went to whether he was telling the truth or not. And at that press conference, I made it very clear that he wasn't. He was lying to the Australian people. And the only reason he was upset was because he lost. So this economic zone, special economic yeah. zone policy is obviously a flagship policy in Tasmania. I'm just keen to, to know, what do you think the other priority issues are here? And do you have a sort of a policy platform, on, particularly on the housing and the health crisis here? Well, certainly housing is a, a big problem, right? And uh, housing's a big problem not just in Tasmania, in Sydney where prices have gone very high. There's different types of housing problems. So first of all, we've got our, our, our tax deductibility of the interest on your home loan, right? And that will really mean that if you stay in the current house that you're in, you're going to get a, a more cash in your hand, which should ha help to alleviate if you're in a, a poverty situation. If you decide that you, you want to get a bigger house, you'll be able to afford to buy one, and that should, that, that should stimulate more growth and demand in our construction industry and create more jobs, and that's a very important issue. Mm, so a major issue here, I guess, is a, a shortage of social housing and just a real, uh, the rents are sky high at the mm. moment. I mean, what's your party's position on addressing some of those issues here locally in Tasmania? Well, well the problem is that there's been no real construction in, in, in volume in Tasmania for a long time and that, that there's a, uh, the demand situation is very high and the stock is very low. So I think what you have to think about is how you can stimulate that demand. And you know, the, the Commonwealth Government should have a serious look at Tasmania, the special economic zone. I've tried to explain to you the aspects from tax, but it goes beyond that too. It's looking at what have we got to do to lift this society up to be equivalent to other places to live in Australia. Why should people be, be penalised because they live in Tasmania? That's what it boils down to. Yeah. Yeah, on the housing, what's your stand on like, immigration? Because What's happening in Tasmania? Well, I'm, I'm talking from real people who run small business, and I speak to a lot of people, and I've witnessed this. Um, well, there's three to four hundred people going for every rental house over here. Mm. Um, there's kids living in caravans all around the place, like, no homes. Uh, in my area where I run my business, mm. they're constructing four hundred houses. Here, Mark, for seeding these refugees. Now, we've got our own people out in the street here. Like, mm. Well, our, our policy of our party is put Australians first, <coughs> right? And what we have to look at our immigration policy really is not to be discriminatory against anyone in particular, but to look at the volume of it, right? And to look at our infrastructure that can take it. Um, and we think that immigration should, should mirror what, it, what our infrastructure is and what our ability is to absorb people. And that should be the overall look at things. At the moment, we've got around 600,000 people coming into Australia. You see here that the figures from Scott Morrison is 148,000, 160,000 from the Labor Party, but it's not. That's what the official immigration figure is. We've got 200,000 students that come over here. We've got 457 people that come over here. We've got a small amount of refugees. If you put that all together over the last five or six years, it's been 600,000 people a year. Now, one of the reasons the politicians don't want to tell you and what, they, won't, they won't attack that and explain a rational for it is because they talk about Australia's growth, that we've had unlimited growth for 27 years. But that unlimited growth, if you look at it each year, has been equivalent to the amount of immigration that we've had each year. We have brought people here, created more demand and created more effects on our GDP. The actual core economy, less the uh, immigration, shows no growth whatsoever. And that's why people say, how can we be in such a good shape economically, yet our lives haven't changed, our lives have slipped backwards because both of the major parties are relying on immigration to have good growth figures. I'm saying we've got to draw a line in the sand and Australians have got to accept what's happening and we've got to try to make sure that we can grow the core part of our economy, not by immigration, but by achievement, by enterprise and by incentive. That's the difference, really. And, sorry, just one last question for me. Um, OK, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have a drink. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and you've talked about how committed you are to helping Tasmania mm. 
mm. lift its prospects. If, if your candidates are not elected into Parliament, what will you do to, to help make Tasmania's lives better? Well, I don't think it changes whether we're elected to Parliament or not. We've still got certain ideas about the country and we mm. won't abandon those things. And we'll certainly be pressing for those things to happen in whatever forum we can. It's not just for Tasmania too. There are similar situations across this country. If you go to Elizabeth in South Australia, where I've just come from, we've got 35% unemployed. If you go to the western suburbs of Melbourne, youth unemployment's approaching 50%. So our whole country really is in a tender box and we need to do something about it and face the real issues. In business, you have to face the real issues or you fail, right? In politics, you can hedge them as long as you want to. But I think enough is enough, and, and we think that the United Australia Party deserves a chance to clean up this country and to make us great again and to put Australia in first. Thanks very much. Is you want another question? Oh, what, what do you think your chances are in Tasmania? We think they're pretty good. I mean, we had a senator elected here, as you know, in 2013, in a very short campaign. We've certainly got a senator of great uh, team of, I think, of great quality leadership in, in, um, in Kevin Morgan and David Williams, and I think we, we should get people in the Senate. Everywhere across the country we can pretty comfortably say that we'll have senators elected in every state and we'll definitely have the balance of power. And I think that's something that we can use effectively to make the, bring the government to the account and maybe we can become the government in the lower house and have seats in the lower house as well um, and to try to make this country a better place. Can I just ask, where are the candidates today? Well, they're just sitting here. There's <coughs> Kevin Morgan's our Senate candidate here. <laughs> Darren Winter, they're standing for Franklin, right? So they're all here. We've got the other candidates here too, so you, you can have a talk to them if you want to. And they're all on our website with their telephone numbers to ring up. All right, thanks very much. Authorised by Clive Palmer for the United Australia Party Brisbane.